Good evening, everyone. I'm Cindy Wolf and one of the co-chairs of the ASI Animal Health Committee, along with Dr. Jim Logan. And we're pleased that we are able to present to you tonight um, a Let's Grow seminar on the use of EID on farm. Um, we have two speakers, um, Dr. Sorry, Mr. Dan Persons, and his title is uh, RFID use on farm and in animal disease traceability. Dan's a fellow Minnesotan with me and a commercial sheep producer of substantial size. So that adds a lot of credibility in my mind to what he'll talk with us about. Um, he's an expert on RFID use and ways that it can improve someone's productivity and profitability and, and able to help you solve about any problem you come up against on your farm relative to electronic ID. Dan is also the U.S. Shearwell representative um, and can also guide us quite a bit regarding Shearwell and their data systems. Our second speaker is Brandon Manning, who has worked for uh, almost 33 years with Allflex, and he will be speaking about how to utilize low frequency ID and flock management and official ID. Brandon too is a producer. Um, I'm not so sure he hasn't had sheep before and he currently has um, beautiful boar goats. And so we're really happy to have them. Before I turn it over to them, I wanna share um, kind of a sad um, thing with all of you. We um, yesterday lost a great friend of the sheep industry and a great sheep vet in this country, Dr. Cleon Kimberling of Colorado. And I'll just read a little bit about what a friend of mine wrote about him. Dr. K, as many of us called him, passed away yesterday morning after a fantastic career championing sheep, sheep management and sheep health. He was an amazing man who never met a stranger, a teacher of many, many veterinarians, a friend to the U.S. sheep industry. He started out working with cattle and made a number of inventions that are still used today relative to cattle uh, production and veterinary medicine. Yeah, he really uh, helped us tremendously in this country in how to identify and reduce the incidence of Brucella ovis in the ram population. And we could go on and on talking about his love of veterinary medicine, his willingness to teach the next generation, plural, and outreach to less advantaged sheep producers worldwide. We would like to share that his family is planning a memorial service um, that will be held at the First Presbyterian Church in Fort Collins, Colorado, and it will also be live streamed I believe the tentative date, and that will be confirmed on the ASI website, is August 6th. And um, we also um, are setting up um, donations in honor and memory of Cleon Kimberling to the ASI Sheep Heritage Fund, which sponsors a scholarship for graduate students who do sheep research. So with that, um, I'd like to remind you that we'll hear from our two speakers. First, Dan persons and then Brandon Manning, and then we'll open it up for questions. And please use the question box to type your questions in, and we will be sure to have these two guys answer as many as possible. Thank you. Okay, I'm Dan Persons, and I'm gonna share with you a little bit of RFID on farm and, and for animal disease traceability. Uh, first, a disclaimer, uh, the products and the companies represented in this slideshow are, are only done so as representation. We're not, don't consider it to be an endorsement by the USDA. We're, we're doing this just to help educate producers. And you'll see, you'll see our company, you'll see things from Merck, um, but we're gonna talk in generalities about what's available in the, in the industry for RFID. 
So why go there? Um, I guess the biggest thing is the ability to gather data fast um, and and accurately to save labor and to be able to intensively manage larger flocks, but also intensively manage small flocks. And because while I have a large flock and it's my full-time job, the small flocks are have equal time constraints on them where your labor is considered off the farm and the sheep have to be done when you have time for it. So the labor savings goes both ways. If you only have a few hours on a weekend to work sheep, you need that to be extremely productive and RFID allows you to do that. Um, you can follow animals through supply chains with EID, uh, through at least some of the major packers. And of course, for disease traceability, um, EID becomes important. The components of it, I'm just gonna go through a little bit. Uh, the first component that we can easily think of is some kind of an RFID device, an ear tag, an implant, a bolus, something that's got a chip in it that's going to be red. And I'm primarily talking in this uh, presentation about low frequency tags, where it's a half duplex or a full duplex tag, and it's passive, where the only thing that's on the tag is a chip number. There's no data stored about the sheep on the tag. There's not even a name or anything associated on the tag other than just a chip number. But they come in tags, implants, boluses would be the common. Um, in the ear tags, there's a couple different, really just two different styles. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is for a button style tag. It's a large coil of copper wire that serves as the antenna and a small microchip that is attached to that antenna and talks back and forth to a reader. And then on the left-hand side, you also have buttons, but the little, I don't know, the little barrel-like items, those are also an EID chip. And it's a very tightly wound copper um, antenna and a microchip, all, in, all encased in a tube of glass. And so it can be very small and very lightweight and placed into many different configurations. Um, the scrapey tags or the RFID devices can be purchased as a scrapey tag. They're referred to as an 840 tag. Um, in order to order these electronic scrapey tags, you must have a scrapey flock ID number like we're all used to, MN12345 or whatever your state your whatever your scrapey flock ID number is, but you also must have a national premise number or a life or a premise identification or premise location number, one of those two. And then the uh, the 840 tag will have a 15 digit chip number chip inside of it, and that number is mandated to be printed on the outside of the tag. So in most cases, the by the time you print the 15-digit chip number, there's not room for other things to be printed on that RFID device. Um, it must start with 840. That is the United States code worldwide. So if you ship animals from the United States to any other country and they read that tag, it's going to start with an 840. The RFID number will be linked to your scrapey flock number within the databases of the USDA. And that's why your premise ID number and your scrapey flock ID number are both required before you can purchase an 840 electronic scrapey tag. Um, one thing that's probably most confusing to people is that you, can, you do not get a choice of what numbers you get on your RFID scrapey tags. Um, they're allocated to the tag manufacturers by the USDA. We just get blocks of numbers and we have to allocate them to you out of the block. 
And every time you order tags, it's going to come from another series of numbers from the USDA. So that's that's kind of a big shocker to people is you won't see your scrapey ID number on these tags and you don't get any choice of where the numbers are or what they start with, other than they're going to be 840s at the start. To purchase 840 tags, you have to do it through an approved vendor. Um, this QR code at the right hand side, if you click on that, it'll take you to the USDA's website. Um, you must supply your flock, your scrapey flock number to the vendor and your national premise ID number or location identification number to the vendor. Those two items need to be linked together in the USDA database. And that can take some time depending on what state you're in. Um, it's a process of them going into their databases and linking those two numbers together. Once it's done the first time, you're good forever, but it's the first time you order tags can be a slightly more of a project. Um, several colors are available for 840 tags depending on the vendor you choose, but generally not blue. So when you're thinking about it, blue tags really is generally not available. Um, and like, and then you can also call the USDA tag, 866 USDA tag, to obtain your identification numbers. Or if you don't know what your national PREM ID number is, you can call that number from a phone line that's in your state and they will direct you and and uh, help you get a national premise ID number or a scrapey flock ID number. The next component, we've had tags. The next component you need to think about is a reader of some kind. And there's several different varieties. There's stick readers. Um, the top two pictures would be stick readers. Then there's data loggers. So the lower right hand corner is a a data logging device that can read an ear tag and then record some kind of data along with it. A lambing record, a death record, um, something along that those lines. And the upper left hand corner, that one too has some ability to, to collect data at the same time it's reading a tag. And then in the lower left hand corner is a panel reader that's that's set up and as the sheep walks past the panel readers, it reads the ear tag and stores those numbers to a list or sends the ear tag number to another device like a scale or a, an app on a phone, something like that. So you need some kind of an EID reader. And then there's various different devices that go along with EID. Um, the left hand side is an automatic drafting, three way sorting drafting crate. Where and I'll show a little quick video of that later. Uh, all air operated. There's panel readers as components, uh, way crates as a component where a reader is linked to a scale. So you can weigh lambs without having to type in a weight and without having to type in an ear tag number. The last component and probably probably one of the most important is some kind of a software. To manage all of the data that you're going to that you're going to gather, and it can be very basic, um, from sort of like a spreadsheet style software, or it can be a complete flock management software that will keep lifetime records and it'll keep genetic lines sorted out and separate. Uh, but good software really makes the data collection much more valuable. That's where the value is is in the in the software and the ability of software to analyze data. Um, a little bit on what's happened in a couple other locations around the world. So in the United Kingdom, their transition to EID started in 2010. They started off with requiring an EID tag and a visual tag for breeding stock and just visual tags for animals under 12 months of age. In 2015, they upgraded and said, all animals will need EID. 
And that actually came not from the, it came not from the government, it came from industry pressure to upgrade everything to EID. And goats followed that. Uh, goats followed the sheep needing two visual tags, but visual tags not eligible for export. They started off and they, for on-farm recording, they needed to have the farmer had to have a record of what tags were allocated when the animals were bought and sold and deaths. Um, they required medicine records to be kept, um, and they required the farmer to produce an annual inventory of their livestock, all all under the the uh, the need for animal disease traceability. And at any point, the government can come in and do an inspection on the farm. That's United Kingdom. Um, external re reporting, they only they needed to record when they moved animals to markets. And at the time this slide was made, about 20% of all of these records were done, were being submitted to the government by paper, so pen and pencil. The other 80% was all online working with uh, software vendors and phone app companies that would automatically send data to the federal databases or national databases. Um, Livestock markets in the UK, they have basically two methods of reading tags. They either use stick readers or they use race readers. Um, the data capture is critical. They, they needed not to just to get tag numbers, but who the buyers and sellers were and where the movements, where they were being moved to. And they basically have one major company that does the software solution for all of the UK markets, which um, really enhances their ability to move forward, but it also means there's no competition. A little bit on what their markets look like. This is uh, one market in the UK. Um, they, that market A had 696,000 sheep that were red, and on sale day they did anywhere between 1,000 and 25,000 head, and they were using panel readers, race readers, to read those tags. And same with market B, 1,000 to 39,000 head in one in a one-day sale. And same with C, 1,000 to 10,000, all using race readers to gather those tag numbers. They have some markets that just use a stick reader. Um, market D, a th between 1,000 and 11,000 head at a sale day, and they're just using a stick reader to gather those tag numbers. Uh, it's, they're extremely efficient. You think a stick reader wouldn't, that you wouldn't be able to deal with a large number of animals in a short period of time, but they're, uh, they're doing it quite efficient. And you can walk in a pen of ewes or in a trailer or in a, in a pen, and it doesn't take more than maybe a minute or two to read all the ear tag numbers in that pen of sheep in the foreground. Uh, maybe less than a minute to read all those sheep. It goes extremely fast. In Canada, 1999, they did mandatory cattle ID. Um, 2003 at BSE, then they did mandatory EID for cattle. 2004, they did mandatory visual tags for sheep about the same time frame for the United States. And in 2012, Canada did mandatory EID for sheep using a single tag. Um, Canadian sheep ID, all sheep have to be tagged before they leave their farm of origin, uh, much like our scrapie system is now. Uh, sheep moving on to the farm, tag replacements and deaths need to be reported. And of course, more regulations are in the pipeline. How do we use the data? Now it comes down to what do you, so you spend money on the EID, you buy a reader, you buy software, what do you do with it and how do you make it, how do you make it work? How do you make it pay for itself? A return on that investment. Um, first and foremost, most, you use the data to select these poor performing use. 
um, and then selecting top producing ewes and only only then saving replacement females out of these top re top producing ewes. Monitoring death losses. Um, I, I look at it as picking the low hanging fruit. I monitor my death loss. I record all the reasons that they died to the best of my ability. And I look at that list at least once or twice a year and say, what's the low hanging fruit? Where's, where's the majority of my death loss taking place and how do I how do I address that and try to lower that death loss? Um, can use it for tracking antibiotic use for natural lamb production and therefore possibility of a, of a premium for those lambs. Tracking daily gains of finishing lambs, determining the best time to market those, whether it's simply marketing by what the market demands, an 80 to 90 pound lamb that they want for a special holiday, or whether it's marketing uh, lambs in a feedlot that have simply quit growing. They're eating every day, but they their average daily gain drops below a, a rate that'll pay for their feed bill. Assessing ram effect on finishing and average daily gain. Uh, transferring data to like NSIP or uh, lamb plan for EBV calculations. Selecting replacement ewe lambs to be able to select the very best ewe lambs out of the very best ewes and try and get longevity in the flock at the same time. And then conducting your own on-farm trials. There's lots of salesmen out there, including me and a lot of others that have a feed supplement or a different ration they want you to try. And EID allows you to to uh, gather enough data to do your own on-farm trials and determine what works best for you. Here's a performance report generated by our software, and this is uh, this is out of my flock, and it's a it, this is the proud page. So this is the top end of the sheep, but it's uh, looking at two years of data by for my females that were born over a five-year period of time, so it's two years of production and looking at how many lambs they had born on average, how many lambs they weaned, where their death loss took place. Was it before tagging or before weaning or after weaning? What was the daily live weight gain of all of their lambs that they sired in those, in those two years? Um, and then where did they go and where, what was the money and what was the breeding behind them? daily live weight gain by sires. And so in this case, it's uh, just one barn of lambs and we ran a feed trial on them and looked at average daily gain from the lambs that were in that pen. And there was a almost a 0.15 difference from the lambs sired by the best to the lambs sired by the poorest gaining um, sires. And it's not fair to look at it at one year or at one barn in one small snapshot. But as you do more and more and you and you compile data over a couple of different years and look at lambs from different dams and different sires, there does get to be some real difference in daily live weight gain from animals. Um, I'm gonna Hopefully this is gonna go. I'm gonna zip through some videos and just show you what happens with EID as you add more, more than just a stick reader. So here's three race reader panels set up, uh, sheep walking through the three. The phone on the other side is reading ear tags of all those sheep as they walk through and tallying them up and putting them in a, in a group. So you can see how in a livestock market, they can run a lot of sheep through readers and this is not a sophisticated reader at all. I'll go to another one. This is on my farm. I've got a an antenna panel set up over the where I'm standing just in front of me. The white hoop is a set of antenna panels. On the post in front of me is my my data recorder 
that's linked to those antenna panels. The sheep are walking through and I'm sorting for breeding groups. So as she sticks her head through the panel, it's telling me left, right, and forward on the screen. Um, all preset, so I know which ewes are gonna go into which group. Uh, it just needs to tell me left, right, and forward. And so she walks in and I'm sorting three ways and I don't have to watch the sheep. All I have to do is watch the screen. So again, it, it can happen pretty, pretty uh, real time. And uh, here's another video of a way crate set up. And they're going to be weighing lambs and doing daily live weight gains as the lambs walk through. Of course, it's a big, big pen of sheep. Um, there's a lot of, there's not a lot. There's a few companies that sell this type of products and uh, that are all integrated with reader panels, scales, some type of a computer system that's linked to it that's going to gather and, uh, it's a little hard to see the recorder, but they're walking through and it's reading the weight, checking against the previous weight and giving an average daily live weight gain since the previous time the sheep came through the crate. So throughputs on these, somewhere in that uh, 250 to 400 animals an hour for weighing is a pretty realistic, uh, pretty realistic number. A lot of steps here though, so think about that a little bit as you as you watch. It's a lot of steps, but it's going fast. Got one person pushing sheep and the other person just has to watch a watch the panels go by or watch the gates open and close. We'll take you to an automatic sorter. Here the gates are air operated. And again, there's several companies that market this type of, of a system where it's either holding the sheep in a crate, grabbing them with a, like a squeeze clamp to hold the sheep with no front and back gates. Um, and yet sorting, sorting three to five and six different ways all with air operated gates. And of course, computer driven and requires an air compressor. Um, and of course, as we go up, the dollar amounts for those increase. But how do you pay for everything? So on 100 U's, if you can just increase lambing percent by 0.1 lambs per U, on 100 U's, that's 10 lambs. At $200 a lamb, that's $2,000 gross money in your pocket. Still have some feed on the lambs, but 2,000 gross. Um, you could take some days off of finishing feed by increasing average daily gain by just 0 0.05 pounds per day is, uh, cuts, cuts down feeding days by about 12 days and that's about $540 of feed savings. Um, culling poor performers and doing it early so you are not feeding them longer than we need to. Reducing death loss by 3%. Um, which really 3% is not very much, but you do that by picking that, that low hanging death cause that is one that you just need to attack and, um, and uh, figure, out, figure out a way to reduce death loss based on the, the death reason that's most prevalent on your farm. Uh, market lambs at the right time, whether that's because of the weight that they need for the market, or because that lamb simply reached its reached its potential and it's quit gaining weight. And then of course, saving labor and record keeping, um, being able to work numbers of sheep in a short period of time. And with that, I'll close and we'll go back to Cindy and, and uh, Brandon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Brandon Manning with Merck Animal Health. 
You may also note it as uh, Allflex USA. Uh, Mark purchased Allflex USA about three years ago, um, around 2019. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to discuss utilizing low frequency tags for flock management and also official ID. You'll see some duplication. Um, the slides won't be duplicated, but the, the subject matter will be the same um, that, that we did with Dan. Um, I'll discuss 840s, Scrapey, but Dan put a view probably more towards uh, some focus on the UK um, and how they utilize uh, EID, not only for traceability, uh, but for flock management. Um, I'm going to look towards, uh, do my presentation on Australia and Victoria. So it kind of shows you a little different uh, perspective um, globally. Benefits of utilizing EID as a management tool. Um, one of the things um, utilizing EID is it provides a second ID. Um, if you've utilized or used visual tags, um, sometimes you do have retention issues with that. Um, and then also uh, some people utilize a, a tattoo, but EID provides a second ID so that you do not lose the ID of those individual animals. Um, it does provide a faster way to collect the ID of the animals being worked. Um, you can use a, a reader and read, scan those animals a lot faster, um, which in, ends up being a time saving uh, mechanism. You also uh, can utilize electronic version versus notebook paper. So we've all been there where you've written ear tag numbers down, you're collecting all this, you take this, your, your notebook paper, or your, your, your work back to the house, and then you have to re-record it um, in an Excel spreadsheet or a software. Electronic version, um, which is a software, software um, it also can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, allows you to do that work there while you're working um, so that you don't have to go back to the house and spend hours uh, recording and updating your work. Again, it saves labor and time. When we look at um, RFID, it eliminates the need for line of sight reading. And basically what that means is when you look at an, a visual tag, you have to actually grab a hold of that view, uh, maybe from a distance, it's gonna be a short distance, but you have to look and read that tag number. Um, RFID uh, being electronic radio frequency, um, the tag does not have to be line of sight. It'll read through tissue such as the ear, um, and the orientation of the tag is, is not dependent on the orientation. Um, the animal can be moving, so it doesn't have to be uh, restrained um, as much as you would if you're trying to read the ear tag as a visual, visual ear tag. And then, of course, data collection can be fully automated um, using the systems available. There's two types of RFID tags that are out there. One of them is passive and the other one is active. Um, and this goes with across all species, but the passive RFID does not have an internal battery. In other words, you don't have to, it's powered by the reader. Um, active RFIDs are powered by a reader. Um, I have some samples here of the passive off to the left. Um, and then off to the right, you have a battery operated active tag. When we look at low frequency, we'll look at the form factors. Um, the first one is a is an air coil. And basically what this is, is it's a roll of copper wire that serves as an antenna. Um, and then you have a chip set. They're available in a HDX, which is half duplex, and available in a FDX, which is full duplex. Um, these type of form factors are primarily used in two-piece tags, but you, there are, there is uh, a single one-piece tag that utilizes this uh, type of form factor. Example uh, of air cool tags for small, small ruminants. Um, we have their pictures here. Like I said, basically they're two-piece tags. Um, and then the one in the center low uh, and the yellow tag is actually a one-piece tag with the air coil um, designed on top of it. The next type of form factor we'll look at is implants. 
This is primarily used in small ruminant um, RFID tags. Implants are over molded or inserted into the male stem. Off to the left, you have a white tag. Um, right behind this number, that's what I call kind of a coffin. So in other words, the implant is in there and the tag is over molded around the implant. The second one, um, the yellow one with the UK, um, the implant is on this side. It's there again, it's over molded. The third one, the implant is inserted inside the stem. And then of course on the fourth one, uh, it's over molded on the side. See if I can do this. There we go. Utilizing EID from the producer level. For producers that manage their animals individually, EID provides a more accurate data per you and lamb basis. And basically what this means is you do have, when you're recording animals, um, you have human error, and that's been documented. With EID, it cuts back that percentage of human error. And human error can be transposing numbers. If I write 717, and then when I get back home, I read that as 917. Do you have a human error there? Also, EID cuts down uh, the labor time. It also ties in with the software, just as Dan uh, showed you, with scales and other management tools to increase um, the way you, do, you manage your animals. It also allows the ease of individual data collection for growth, wool, and other traits. Utilizing EID or RFID for official tags. In addition to all benefits that RFID can provide as a management tool, the tags also meet the requirements for the US Scrapey program. And here I have two different uh, uh, options on, on Scrapey tags. These are 840 tags. Um, to, to participate in this program, just like with this, the Scrapey visual tag, you must obtain a flock number, flock ID, and a national premise number, PIN, or an LID uh, from your state animal health office. Um, and you can call the, the toll-free number there uh, to get your flock ID, and then also have your PIN LID link, linked to your flock ID. The USDA 840 official numbers will also be linked to your flock and premise number for traceability. So as Dan, Said, said a while ago, these are linked to your premise or your flock number, not by your name and not by your uh, your address or your farm. It's it's through the flock and premise number. Um, and then you go ahead and purchase the scrapey tags from approved approved provider or vendor. How do you purchase the 840 tag? Um, this can be done. Uh, there's a list provided on the APHIS sheep and goat identification webpage. Um, and you give your provider your flock ID and PIN number. Again, as a disclaimer, these systems, tags, and pictures being shown are only exa examples and are not endorsed by the USDA. So now let's look at EID um, and readers, which are accessories to software. When you think about this, EID and readers, they're just like a printer, they're an accessory. They really don't do or have much. Uh, value unless you have a software that's the driver. Um, they rely solely on the software that drives the animal management system. You can also use simple spreadsheets like an Excel uh, to, to commercially with a available herd software um, needed to manage animals on the ranch level. If EID is used as an official ID, readers are not needed at the ranch level uh, for to producer to participate. So we get those questions all the time. People are looking and say, well, if I go to an RFID 840 tag for my Scrapey program, do I have to buy a reader? The answer is no. The animals, if, if once you get the tags, you apply them to your use, that is what you're required to do. Uh, 
as far as the traceability for, for scraping. Options that are used uh, along with EID, you have several. Um, Dan went over these before, but they're handheld accessories and data collection. You can use your cell phone, you can use tablets, um, you can use scale heads. Um, there's a picture of a, a printer here. If you want to print um, information as it pops up, there's a variety of handheld um, data collection um, that these readers can be Bluetooth or wired to to uh, manage your flock. Low frequency um, can also be used in automation product, products. Um, here we have some pictures of some sorters um, and different deals. It can also be incorporated into handling systems. Um, it can also be used in high flow systems. So we typically see high flow systems in maybe auction markets or feed lots, that kind of a deal, unless it's a big ranch, but it reads uh, many animals at a high flow. And this is a reader. Um, it's on based on all three sides and catches all the EID tags as the sheep are going through there. The next I'm gonna look at uh, global official ID and traceability. Um, what countries have official ID programs? Um, I'm going to talk about Australia, New Zealand, um, a little bit about the database, and then some videos. So when we look globally um, at official ID program programs for ovine, um, in China, uh, they do have official ID. They have approximately 183 million um, views, and it is required at birth. So ID is required at birth. Um, Australia, which is uh, they also have um, uh, official ID programs, and they utilize the half duplex only. Same way with Victoria, and we'll see a video here in a second with Victoria. Uh, New Zealand has traceability, and they're in the process of uh, noting the EID version. Uh, the European Union, uh, United Kingdom, Turkey, uh, the UAE, India, Russia, and Quebec. Next, we'll look at uh, the NLIS, which is a program based out of Australia, and particularly Ag Victoria. Um, software, remember, is the key to traceability. So when we look at this next video, you'll see different strides where the software companies, they must, um, they can be used individual multiple software companies within an official ID, but they need to be accessible by all parties. Producers and packers are basically the bookends. In other words, the producer is the one who applies the RFID tag, and then that's where traceability begins. And then at the packer, the animal is bred. The in-between, such as markets, are places called sightings. So whether they're bred then, um, when they change hands or not, basically they're looking at a bookend um, traceability. We'll look at this video, um, and when we do, um, you'll. This is a video that Ag Victoria uh, made, and, and it's available on on YouTube. But what they did is they implemented EID not only for animal disease traceability, but also for full traceability for marketing lamb uh, to compete at a global level. So they'll tell you that most majority of their lamb is exported. And so their export customers uh, to compete on a global level, they felt that they needed to have full traceability and sell market lambs um, with traceability. In this video, um, they'll interview the auction markets, um, a couple of producers, and then one of the packers. Uh, also in this video, when you look at it um, and watch the auction markets have a three-way sorter. So the, the, the lambs are brought into the auction market um, in this three-way sorter is panel readers, and they're when they sort them, they're reading the EIDs and you know, not only counting, um, but seeing the IDs of the animals as they're sorted. And I'm gonna switch, I gotta switch my audio, so hang on just a second. And we'll play this. Victorian's livestock industries are essential to our rural and regional communities. 
Their future relies on strong traceability systems, providing confidence to consumers both here and overseas. Victoria began implementing electronic identification of sheep and goats from 2017. At that time, the value of livestock processed was $4.7 billion. Victoria's sheep and goat industries, through strong collaboration with government, have played a significant role in shaping the electronic national livestock identification system. This has led to innovation and development of tailor-made software, hardware and data processing technologies. The whole supply chain is now capable of collecting, recording and analysing electronic identification data. Sheep meat producers and wool growers are increasingly adopting electronic NLIS technology for flock management and performance recording purposes. I'm Charlie DeFagley and our property is Quamby and it's situated in Dobie which is just east of our act. and we've got a prime lamb flock running predominantly composite uh, ewes and we put EID tags in about 10 years ago. So all our flock now have um, EID tags. We did that because we're individually measuring use for fleece weight measurement. EID works really well if you're taking measurements because firstly, it stops a lot of mistakes in transposing figures. So that element of uh, error was completely cut out. And I think that anyone in the wool industry wanting to improve either their fleece weights or microns, it would be a no brainer to use it. The more and more we use it, the better off it'll be. Where producers use the capabilities of electronic data on farm, the benefits far outweigh the small additional cost of the tag. The on-farm data capture allows producers to make informed decisions around market specifications and productivity. The software used in Victorian sale yards connects to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, which has been transformational. Next generation high flow readers developed by industry with government funding have led to efficient scanning. As a sale yard, once agents enter in the data onto their tablets, so when vendors are booked in, I know how many sheep are actually in the sale yards, what vendors are in what pens. People were quite uh, happy with the way that there was no balking through our freeway draft system. All our data entry, our buys, uh, that is done on the fuller hammer, put into the uh, tablets that we have uh, assembled there. Uh, and that's fed straight through our office. There was plenty of times a paper system we had in place was hard to follow, hard to read, got lost or dirty. The, the improvements and efficiencies have been massive in our business. With our uh, software, I can go down to the delivery yards and scan one animal, and I know who, what abattoir or end user that is. If I have anything that's getting near their curfew time for them to be in the sale yards, I can actually, again, use my tablet and software. So then I can contact the livestock transporters and they'll let me know if they're leaving, they're forgotten, and then I can put them out of the paddock. The uh, electronic ID system changed our, how we do things in the yards and how much more uh, advanced we are in, in the sale yards program now. So when you do get to the office at the end of the day, our reconciliation is 100% is right. At the point the animal is processed, the tag is scanned and electronic data is linked to the carcass, allowing for individual carcass data to be fed back to the producer for commercial benefit and to the processor to better manage input costs. We believe it really gives Victoria, Victorian producers and Victorian processors the ability to uh, have that extra amount of information that they can provide to our customers. So we think that this system really does enhance our traceability capabilities. Prior to that, it was all in batches or all mob-based, whereas now it's an individual carcass. So we can actually trace that individual carcass all the way through. Through ongoing collaboration and innovation between government and industry, electronic traceability provides verified and accurate whole of life data. The contributions and combined efforts through the livestock industry will continue to build on and shape the future of sheep and goat production. We realised that it was coming in, uh, we embraced it. Everything just seemed to roll seamlessly through and, and the efficiencies and the savings in our business were, were great and more than we ever thought they would be. We would never go back to the old way now. Victoria's livestock okay. industries are essential. All right, switch back. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about USDA or US traceability. What do we have here in the States? 
Um, currently, we have the the three uh, traceability. These are third party companies. Um, one of them is the Wisconsin Livestock Identification Consortium. This started back probably about 10, 12 years ago, um, where Wisconsin stepped up and wanted to identify the animals, um, all species. They started out with dairy, but it, they ended up with sheep also. Um, they have traceability. The next one is Trace First, which is primarily feeder cattle. And then the third one is IMI Global. IMI Global is, uh, they do not only uh, crops, but they do all species of animals. Um, as a third party, and they are probably one of the largest as far as having full traceability um, for for marketing uh, product. And that's it. So I will uh, appreciate it, and I will hand it back to Dr. Wolf. Hmm. Well, just. Quickly, before we jump to questions, which Jay Parsons going to kindly um, ask of our presenters, I was remiss in reminding us of two things. One, um, this webinar it, tonight is part of a two-part series. Um, the next webinar about EID um, will occur on July 12th, and it will feature Julie Frenzel from the University of California, where she's been doing a cost-benefit study of employing EID in sheep flocks, and also a panel of producers from around the country, California, Montana, and Michigan, who have incorporated EID regularly into their operations. And secondly, we need to thank and acknowledge the USDA, who through a cooperative agreement um, has helped fund um, <clears throat> these two webinars and some other ongoing EID efforts regarding sheep in this country. So with that, Jay, if you'll kindly um, share some of the questions with Brandon and Dan, that would be fantastic. Yeah, gladly, Cindy. So we hit, did have some questions come in while they were speaking, and I'll, I'll do those first, but just a reminder, everybody, you can uh, uh, type questions in the question box and we'll get them to the speakers as they come in. Or if you'd like to ask them yourself, just raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you and unmute your microphone and you can just talk directly with folks. Uh, so the first one that came in uh, actually came in a couple of different forms, but it has to do with the official 840 RFID ear tags. And there's a few things to cover, but the main one, the one we'll start with is RFID implants and boluses are not accepted by USDA. That's a question. And then also, um, what about implanted chips under the skin, like our pets? I understand that technolo there's technology now where they do not migrate. You guys, uh, I don't know who wants to go first, Brandon or Dan or Cindy, if you'd like to pipe, uh, pipe in on those two in terms of the official 840 tag. Uh, Brandon, you're muted right now. There you go. You bet. So thank you. So implants, uh, they are uh, approved in the variety that is in a plastic tag. So on that slide where I talked about it being over molded, um, you can go to the USDA's website on APHIS on I approved ID um, and they have a list there. Implants can be used for uh, non market animals um, and they have to be for like instance, a tail head behind the ear um, so that they do not get in the food chain. But there again, um, those implants are listed that are approved. Um, as far as migration, uh, migration was an issue several years ago. Most of the companies that provide uh, implants that go underneath the skin, I have some form, of form factor that slows down or prevents them from migrating too much. Cindy, do you have anything to add to that? I know you've looked at that issue over the years. <clears throat> I, I think the dairy goat folks, as they've moved to using um, under the tail, um, have been pretty happy with that site. And um, I'm happy to be corrected, but I also think under the left dew claw, um, especially in goats, is being used and is an approved site as well. Um, so. Okay, very good. 
Um, so another one on the uh, officialness of it, you, um, I think uh, Dan had some pictures up there initially of a lot of different tags. And so the question was, is, uh, many when that was up, it was many of those tags are not considered official ID in the US. Is there any movement to accept more types of EID for official US tagging? Dan, are you aware of anything in that regards in terms of more of those different types of brands of tags being accepted? You're muted, Dan. Go ahead. And... There you go. You're good. Okay. I'm not aware of anything, but then on the other hand, there's nothing to stop tag companies from approaching the USDA and asking for USDA approval for their device. But it's not as simple as just writing a letter and saying, we want to do it. You have to put your tag through a fairly arduous testing that can take up to a couple of years to run your tag through trials, through the FDA trials, um, in order to get it approved through the USDA. So it's not just a matter of asking, they have to pass the test too. So I think that's that's part of it, Jay, is it's, they've got to actually put their tags through the test, so. Okay, and while we have you talking, somebody asked, does Shearwell have any tag readers in stock yet? That sounds like a personal <laughs> question. <laughs> <gonna> call me. <laughs> okay. Getting closer, I, I will say that, we're getting closer. Okay, along those lines with the different manufacturers, this, I think this is a really good question. Do EID tags and EID readers need to be the same brand manufacturer or can they be two different brands? You guys, and you guys can all probably speak to this, the ability to mix and match some of these components from different uh, manufacturers. So you can mix and match. Uh, there's regulations that are set globally uh, for manufacturers with not only readers uh, and the tags, but all the products should be able to, they have to be able to mix back and forth. So you can buy a brand A reader and use brand B tag. What gets more complex is when you start matching a reader with another component or a reader with a piece of software or a reader with a tablet or a phone because not all Bluetooth is created equal and not all means of communications between devices is created equal. So while, while there's international standards on the tags that we produce and on the readers that we produce, there are no international standards to say that my reader has to connect with brand B, Scalehead, because of the communication protocols that take place between those components. So it's Yes, all tags can be read by all readers, providing it's a low frequency tag, but not all readers can communicate with every peripheral device you might put out there. And some of that is software determined. So, so it gets much more complicated as you get into more and more devices and more components that you put together. And Cindy, I know you've used a lot of different types over the years. you have any other experiences you want to share or mix and match? <laughs> I, I would just compliment these two gentlemen because they're tremendous resources when you're at your farm and you um, start to hit one of those bumps in the road. If they know ahead of time that you might be calling upon them to help you work through those bumps, um, usually you get work, you can work through it real time and, and move on with your day. Um, so, but yeah, I think good planning goes a long way. So it's good to ask these guys, hey, I'm thinking of branching out to um, having my scale, talk to my reader and what do you recommend for options there prior to just going with what's the lowest cost option and thinking everything's gonna be great. Yeah, by all means you need to talk to you need to talk to your reader manufacturer before you go start buying more components to add to your reader. Uh be it a scale or a printer or a drafter or a sorter. Um it's it's more complex than what we might think. Good advice. And yeah, it's like with any technology, it's not foolproof. 
but yep. you got to be determined and ask a lot of questions. So, uh, yeah, so I'm interested in this one, Brandon. While you were talking, you had that video uh, with the, uh, um, I guess, testimonial on people increasing their wool productivity. So uh, somebody asked, they're interested in finding out more on the IF using the RFID for improving wool. Um, do you have anything more to share on that, especially with the experiences through all flex and stuff? Well, improving wool, I guess that's a, it's not going to, EID is not going to improve the wool. Um, but what it does is it's better management. So Dan had pointed out earlier with weights, um, it's a cull keep factor. You know, if you can cull your lowest 10% performing use as far as genetics, um, we'll identify the better genetics um, and do it from that direction. Then also, um, when you are grading your wool, um, electronic ID there, you can match the, the ID of the animal and create, create that into your software, your management software, to, to basically start to identify individually um, and to, to identify the higher performance, higher performing animal, and then also identify the lower performing animal. So I've got some producers that are using their RFID readers, linking it to a printer, and as they as they beep on or as they read the electronic tag, they're printing off a barcode number that corresponds to the chip number that's in the sheep. That little piece of paper with a barcode goes on the shearing floor by the ewe that's getting sheared. The wool grader picks up the piece of paper and the fleece carries it over. They scan the barcode into the scale and the weight goes in without having to type a tag number. The barcode follows that fleece over to the um, wool grading machine, the, called the UFTA machine, because we're Minnesota, but it follows to the grader. That machine reads the barcode and the measurements for that wool are all all taken through electronic format without anybody having to transpose a tag number. And so that's kind of the progression. And it it's allowing them to make real time at, we'd call it speed of commerce kind of things within that uh, data gathering session. So, and eliminating a tremendous amount of the human error. Okay, now we'd all like to think these tags just stay in the ears forever and they walk around with this wonderful ear jewelry, but they don't always. Uh, so if a tag is lost from an animal, but you but can be linked to the animal, how do different softwares handle the re-identification of the same animal with a new, but with a new tag? So I don't know who wants to go first. Brandon, you want to speak to that first? So it would be just like losing your visual tag. Um, you'd pull the ID, that individual animal up um, if you've got a second ID, um, and basically you reincorporate, you apply a new RFID tag and uh, log it into your software. That would be the same with Shearwell software. And most softwares on the market, you would simply, you really need to have two forms of ID. So if they lose one ear tag, you can go back and still find the animal and then you give them a new EID tag or a new visual tag or whatever it might be and let the software reconnect a new tag to the old data. Okay, very good. Um, let's see, somebody asked about, when the discussion was about pet implants and they talked about frequency Pet implants are a different frequency than livestock uh, readers can read. Um, and you guys spoke a little bit about the frequency stuff and it being more standardized. You want to say a little bit more about that in terms of other EID stuff that's out there? Go ahead, Brandon. That's your oh. wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> so there are different uh, implants that are out there. In the livestock industry, uh, we mentioned this, Dan mentioned it, there's the International Standard Organization. They set that, the standard, which has to do with the frequency. Um, so, and the USDA, an approved 840 tag has to be the same frequency 
uh, as the uh, as the livestock tag. Merck probably is a, has two different implants that are in the pet industry. Um, one of them is Home Again, and all of ours are ISO compatible. But you can buy non-840 chips that are not ISO compatible, and they're still out there. Back to that reader issue. If you buy a non-ISO approved ID implant, our re all the readers that are sold here in the United States, all of us have ISO, we meet ISO standards. Our readers will not read that implant. Okay, very good. And a follow up on the uh, tag retention question it had to do with the location of the tag in the ear. Any advice on the best location of the tag in the ear for both retention and reading? Well, with Shearwell tags, there are studies they've done for our particular tag. Not for everybody's tag, but for our particular tag, the best retention comes from a tag placed on the top of the ear, about a third of the way away from the head. And that's our best retention on our tags. And that follows, then that also follows where the, the larger, bulkier part of the tag has to be inside the ear, not outside the ear. It's, uh, that's where we see our best retention. But it's different for different tags. So, so our tags are primarily two piece. Um, they want to, if you look, grab a hold of here, you basically got the three veins or elastics uh, that hold the hold the ear, the form. Um, it needs to be between the second and third in the middle. Um, the EID female portion needs to be on the inside of the ear, not on the outside for the best retention. Um, also, management. Um, when you, even if you're talking about visual tags or EID, any type of tag, you're applying a tag and you're punching a hole through an ear. You'll have improved retention if you disinfect the part. Well, I'll call it the male stem or the male portion that goes through the ear, because a lot of times retention issues stem from uh, poor management practices as they're not um, disinfected. So you personally or the, the handlers have grabbed those ear tags. You've got dirty hands. You've been handling sheep all day. Um, either you're wearing gloves. You grab a hold of that tag. You've got bacteria and you'll have infection issues, um, especially on, on sheep. Ears can get infected real easy. And when it does, you know, it's just like you. When you get infection, it's going gonna, it's gonna to itch um, and try to scab over. You may have a little... Uh, it, at some infection, um, but to clean that up, you know, if you think if you were doing something else, you need to have a, you need to disinfect that male and you'll increase your retention rate, uh, I think across the board of, of, with all tags. And Cindy, I know I've heard you and Dr. Kimberling talk about infections with the ear tags. I don't know if you have anything to add there or not. But... I would just say that if you tag young lambs you seem to have less infection and then also it seems to be infection risk is higher the more hot and humid um, the time of year and then lastly there's a um, product that's got a little lube and a little um, chlorhexidine disinfectant and you could just put a dab of that on that male stem when you put the tag in but it's kind of like, like anything when you need to vaccinate your sheep you don't pick a a day where they're wet. You pick a day when they're dry. And so that's, if I was gonna go put RFIDs in today in a group of 100 sheep, um, I'd probably pick more like October or March than I would right now, because there's flies and it's hot and humid and it's probably not gonna be a lot different tomorrow. Yeah, and I'd add to that the other extreme, the extreme cold. <laughs> I don't know if you guys put tags in in the cold, but that can be uh, torturous. <laughs> okay, um, somebody mentioned that they've had very little luck with sheep and goats running next to readers and trying to get them to read. They essentially have to stop the animals to read them. They've tried it with both a panel reader and uh, all flex wand. So uh, I don't know, Brandon, if you want to address that first in terms of your experience with some of those different uh, pass-through reader systems. Right, so it sounds like it's in a, di a distance. 
issue. Um, primarily on these lightweight, small ruminant tags, the tags are FDX, except for the implants are HDX. Um, but you do have a read range issue. So on those panel readers, it depends on the size of the panel. Uh, depends on the brand. The, the furthest distance that I've seen that you can probably get is about 36 inches. A lot of them may be that eight to 12 inches uh, from the panel. Um, so you do have to narrow those those sheep down. Um, same way with the stick reader. You've got to get within the read range. And that's according to the reader and the tag and where it's placed. And... Anything to add to that, Dan? Well, with panel readers, we generally recommend a dual panel. So if you're gonna put panels on a race to read tags, you put a dual panel that is uh, purposely designed for that, and it will it almost it really makes it a hundred percent read on a tag, no matter which ear the tag is in, it's going to get read. Um, that would be our recommendation is is a dual panel reader um, and then tags have an orientation to them as well, especially with stick readers, where it'll read a shorter, a longer distance if the tag is oriented properly with the antenna in the stick. So you might get a six inch read if it's uh, oriented as a T to the stick. You might get a three inch read if it's oriented parallel to the stick, because there's, there's a difference on how the, tag antenna lays and how the stick reader antenna lays, so. Okay, good. We we had a question come in by email beforehand and I see somebody else asked something similar. Uh, with, it, with regards to individual feeding units, you know, like a grow safe unit or something like that that people are talking about. Uh, basically, it's essentially do these EI, RFID tags work with those types of systems that are doing feeding trials and so on? The GrowSafe is an HDX half duplex system. Almost all the feeding systems are HDX only. Okay. Due to readability and read rate. And you, you want to give them a brief summary of that HDX versus FDX? I say brief because I know it can be complicated, right, 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 but I know the so reading range is different and their design different. So. Okay. So. On HDX, which is half duplex, um, the reader sends out the, the RF radio frequency. It grabs the tag and brings it back. So basically, a HDX, HDX tag, it energizes it. I don't know if you recall my PowerPoint, um, the chipset. Um, it's a little larger, and basically, it grabs a hold of that read when it coming, the power is coming from the reader. Um, it listens and then sends it back. Full duplex is a constant sending, uh, receiving mode, if that makes sense. So the read range on HDX is longer um, than FDX. Also in the dairy, all your dairy and parlor equipment is all HDX because FDX, full duplex, um, outside RF equipment such as pumps, air conditioners, um, anything like that, electrical equipment, will actually uh, decrease the read range. Um, they call it RF noise, radio frequency noise. Um, it decreases the readability of FDX. So that's why you see in dairies, they're basically 100% HDX. It's based around readability. Yeah, and I'd, I'd echo that. Um, I had a, I had an air compressor to run my drafting crate, an old, just a little cheap air compressor. And it used to sit right next to my drafting crate and worked perfect for five or six years. Then the air compressor died. So I bought a different air compressor and set it right next to the drafting crate, just like my other one did. My antenna panels in the drafting crate would only work properly when the air compressor was not running. As soon as the air compressor turned on, my read, my reading on the ear tags went way, they still read, but it took them a while and it got slow and it finally would read a tag. Air compressor shot off, 
and everything blew through as fast as you could ever want it to go. So radio noise does it. Um, the previous question about a tag reader, a panel reader and a stick reader not wanting to work. If you have a panel reader running on your panel and then you go to try to use your stick reader in that same raceway, they won't work. They will cancel themselves out and you won't get a read on either one of them most likely. But more than likely the stick reader will just quit working. When it gets too close to that antenna panel, the panel readers, the sticks will just quit working. So electrical noise is a big issue. But but less so with HDX equipment than it is with with uh, FDX equipment. So we have a shear well system question for you, Dan. <laughs> um, basically, as do with if the tag's fallen out and they've replaced it uh, with a new tag, will that change the flow into Pedigree Master when you export that data to Pedigree Master for EBV calculations? No, it will not. That whoever it is, they need to talk to me because we don't. We do not use the tag number when we go into Pedigree Master. We use whatever's in the name field on that sheep, and that does not change when you change the tag number. So, no. Okay. And we had a question on Apple products. Do the readers work with Apple products? That's a good question. So there's apps available um, at the App Store. Um, and so if you're going to use an, an Apple product, it must be approved and they get it through the App Store um, for designed for Apple products, if that makes sense. So the manufacturers have to get with Apple and they get approved and a license um and and to do that and then you're you can sell it and use an apple product if that makes if that makes sense so it's a licensing is licensing agreement through app okay um there was sorry i lost a question here Oh, this is for any of you actually. Is there an amount of sheep that would be cost effective to have the EID tags? That's a loaded question because it's just the tags. You only just need the one tags, sheep. no you problem. Only need one sheep to put the tag in. <laughs> <That's> a, <yeah. laughs> any advice I, I, on that? Well, I will tell you, I, I have producers that have 30 U's and I have producers that have 4,000 U's. Each have their own reason for going with EID. They they absolutely have their own reason. The 30 year U producer is uh, highly data intensive, and they do export of their sheep. So they need an 840 tag, and they need records behind them, and they have a job that's off the farm and demands a tremendous amount of their time. So they don't want to spend time in their keeping records and they don't want any errors. Then you go to the very large flocks and it's a whole different scenario. They, they're they doing it for different reasons and I can't say there's you know, a threshold that makes sense. I thought there, when I first started, I thought there was, but I've learned that there's not. There's no threshold I can throw out there and say, you need 250 U's to make this work. Because it's not true. There's there's people with jobs that are 80 hour a week jobs and they still have their sheep and they want to do all their weighing in an hour and a half on Saturday afternoon. And that's it. Well, they need better, faster equipment to do that. So they move to EID. That's, that's their choices. And that, I guess that's the bottom line. It's a personal choice. And uh, the tags themselves are not that much more expensive. In fact, sometimes cheaper than a visual tag. So it's not the cost of the tag, it's the cost of everything that goes along with it. And it also has to do with your time. It's what, what value do you place on your time? 
a lot of people place a lot of value, dollar value on the time that they haven't spent working their animals. So if you can cut that back, what does that value cost? And like just Dan just said, it's every producer is different. And the other thing is, is that today's stick readers, for example, they're so robust, you don't plan to have to replace it anytime soon. I mean, I've been guilty of losing ours in our barn for about six weeks until I finally found it. And um, it's one of those things should have beat me over the head. I've left it out in the cold. I've left it out in the hot and it just keeps on working. You hardly ever have to charge it. It's just a very reliable thing. So it's easy to say like, go buy a lawnmower, go buy a vacuum cleaner. I mean, you spend a fair bit on those, but you expect them to work for a number of years and your stick reader performs just the same. So it pencils out. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we've used up most of our time here, uh, leaving some time for the wrap up, Cindy. I wanna thank all of our folks for all the great questions and comments that came in. And of course, our panelists for all their great answers. So I'll turn it back to you, Cindy, to, to wrap things up and set things up for the next webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody who's participated. Thank you particularly to our speakers. And uh, they are truly friends of the industry. We are not always an industry who adopts technology as fast as we should. And these two guys are, have been here for us and will be here for us. I haven't heard anything about retirement, thank goodness. And uh, they, they understand completely the value of, of this technology and how it really can help you, like they say, in about any size operation and, and help you with your goals. So um, with that, I would just say the other thing I'd like to praise these guys about is if you send them a message outside of this webinar, I guarantee you'll get a very thoughtful reply that um, will stand you well. So I know there have been some other questions and, and we welcome um, being able to answer those directly if you want to reach out and hopefully you'll come and join us um, July 12th for the next EID webinar because I think that will be very, um, informative as well. Okay, thanks Cindy and thanks everybody. With that, we'll, we'll go ahead and sign off for this evening and uh, thank everybody for joining us and have a good evening. Thank you, good night. Thank you.